Welcome everyone to day two of the DeLand Conference. We had a wonderful day yesterday and today we're dealing with two incredibly important topics, climate change and making a more equitable world. Um, as we uh, did yesterday, uh, the speakers will each talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll have five minutes for Q&A. And at the end of the day, there'll be a panel discussion with all of the speakers. Uh, welcome more of your questions. And we'll have breaks throughout the day uh, for coffee and lunch. Um, so without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sylvia D, professor from climate science. Thank you so much. Great, good morning and nice to see you all. So um, as Tony just mentioned, I'm Sylvia. I'm a climate scientist here at Rice in the Earth Sciences Department. And I'm just gonna do a quick introduction to the topic of climate change before we get into our three keynote talks for today. Um, and I just briefly wanna talk about the science of climate change and solutions. And we'll hear from all three speakers in great detail about some of the solutions that we can put forward to face the climate crisis. Um, so I started studying earth science in college and I was really transfixed by sort of the beauty and chaos of the climate system. This is a animation from NASA uh, of aerosols in the atmosphere. You can see Harvey slamming into Houston just now. Uh, Irma, this is the summer of 2017, which was a record hurricane season. Uh, and then meanwhile, you can see in the Pacific Northwest smoke burning from wildfires. So really at this point, at any given time, uh, you know, half of our country is on fire while the other half is underwater. So this is not a future problem. This is a now problem. This is our climate reality in the present. And when it comes to climate change, the science is simple, the impacts are serious, and the problem is solvable. Um, so we know that our atmosphere keeps Earth at a habitable temperature. Without our atmosphere, without our greenhouse effect, Earth would be on average about minus 20 degrees Celsius, so we'd be a frozen planet. So we actually really need the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere to keep Earth supporting liquid water and life, for example. But right now, we're profoundly altering the chemistry of Earth's atmosphere by adding carbon dioxide, methane, uh, greenhouse gases. We're essentially using the atmosphere as a dumping ground for excess carbon. And this graph on the right here shows the growth of carbon emissions over time from about 1960 to today. So at any given year, we're putting about 37 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere every year. Uh, and if you add up the entire impact of that extra carbon, the way we talk about those impacts in climate science is as a function of how much extra heat the atmosphere traps. So for example, um, the extra radiation retained by human activities alone is about three watts per meter squared. So you've probably all changed a light bulb. You know what watts are. So you have like a 60 watt light bulb. So three watts might not sound like a lot. <laughs> Right? That might sound like a very tiny amount of energy, but notice that it's per meter squared. So if I ask you to multiply three watts times the surface area of the campus or the surface area of Texas, or for example, the surface area of planet Earth, uh, what we get is four nuclear explosions per second. So we're profoundly altering the amount of energy in Earth's climate system every single year. The human influence on the climate system is unequivocal, and we've known this since the 1960s. And as a result, we know Earth is warming. We have weather station data, satellite data, very clearly shows, for example, temperatures in the United States. These are departures from a long-term average from the 1890s all the way through today. Uh, we can see the red bars show warming, the blue bars show relative cooling. Especially in the last four decades, Earth is warming rapidly. And of course, there are physical changes in the Earth system we can see very clearly, like melting ice sheets, sea level rise. But these physical changes can be somewhat abstract. And what we really care about, especially at this conference today, is how those impacts influence us as humans. How does this impact our lives? And of course, the impacts are serious and they're all around us. These are two uh, maps from the National Climate Assessment, which NOAA puts together for a lower carbon emission scenario and a higher carbon emission scenario on the right. This is the increase in the number of days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit by mid 21st century. So we're looking at, depending on where you live in Texas, between one and three additional months per year over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now this of course will have profound impacts on things like agriculture, 
fire risk, but also on people who work outdoors or student athletes. So the, the human health impacts of these changes really cannot be understated. Um, I've since started at Rice, had a few students every year who have had to go home because their homes burned down. Um, these are impacts that are affecting our colleagues and our students every year. Uh, and of course, if any of you have ever been to Lake Mead or the Hoover Dam in the Southwest, um, water shortage issues are gonna become a real problem. <laughs> Uh, they're already a problem for us here in Texas, but in our neighboring cities in the southwest, right, this is the water line where it used to be, where you see that bathtub ring. The water level in the reservoir that supplies water to the city of Las Vegas has dropped 150 feet below the pipes that pump it into the city. So there are infrastructure challenges, there are water availability challenges. A lot of my lab's research actually focuses on the other extreme, which is flooding. This is an image of the lower Mississippi River Basin. On a normal day, you can see the river weaving through an agricultural area, and then on the day of a major flood. And almost every year, it seems, this river basin has been flooding um, more frequently and more severely. We know that as we warm up the atmosphere, it can store more water. So if you've ever been outside in the summertime, you know that it can be more humid, right? compared to a day like today where it's annoyingly humid, but not quite so bad. <laughs> um, so as we heat up the atmosphere, the total amount of rainfall that's falling in those top extreme events is going to increase. And similarly, the amount of rain we expect in tropical cyclones and hurricanes is going up. This is some, a picture from a nearby intersection. I'm sure many of you lived through Hurricane Harvey. I don't know why. This gentleman is smiling because it cost us $125 billion. So of course these disasters are expensive um, and they're lasting for a longer amount of time. So we hear in the news about uh, these events and it's easy to forget, but some of our neighbors in other cities are experiencing these disasters for months at a time. Uh, unfortunately, in Kentucky just a few weeks ago, you know, it's easy to tune out the news on these topics, but tens of people are dying in these events. And of course, uh, you know, I like to make the joke that Texas is winning in terms of how much we're paying for climate and weather disasters. This is a map showing the total number of billion dollar weather events um, in 2022. And so what you can see is the dark red color means that Texas has paid the most money in terms of having to deal with climate and weather disasters. Florida, Louisiana are close behind us. But this is costing us, and if we don't invest in this problem now, if we don't invest in solutions now, this map is not gonna change. This is gonna keep costing us a lot of money. So of course what we wanna know is how much worse are these disasters going to become? So a big part of what I do in my research is using climate models to understand future climate changes on Earth, specifically in the United States. We're very different in the earth sciences from our friends in biology or chemistry because we don't have a perfect mini earth that we can put in a test tube and heat up. Earth is a gigantic complex system. So the best substitute we have are numerical representations of the ocean and the atmosphere. And essentially, we run these models forward in time and we look at how temperature or drought conditions, for example, evolve over the 21st century. And climate models, this is NASA's climate model, there are many others, show us very consistent futures. We're up against a hotter, drier future, which will stress our societies greatly. I also think it's important for us to think about where we've been and where we're going. So we study paleoclimate or past climates on Earth as a way to contextualize the rates of climate change happening now. Because I can stand in front of you today and say, Earth is warming faster than any other time we see in geologic history. Do you believe me? <laughs> I hope so, because I'm a climate scientist. But um, I, I can tell you that we use ice cores and tree rings and coral data, data that capture temperatures before thermometers were invented, to help us understand how Earth is changing now under human influence compared to other periods in the past. So for example, many of you probably know, it's not just a children's movie. We do have ice ages every 100,000 years over the past million years. This is the last one about 18,000 years ago. If you're from the Great Lakes region, right? These are all glacial lakes. 
and we know Earth's climate history going back hundreds of millions of years. So this graph on the far left, time is moving from left to right, this is 100 million years ago on the far left to today and into the future on the right. The colored curve is the global mean temperature averages over time and CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere below it. So you can see that there are time periods where Earth was much hotter, like the mid-Cretaceous, or much colder at the last ice age. If you look to the right, these are the temperature projections depending on how much carbon we put in the atmosphere. So where does this put us in the context of human evolution and mammalian evolution? So humans came on the scene, you know, around a million years ago. Kind of a cold time period in Earth's history. We were totally fine through the ice ages. We were hunting woolly mammoths, taking them down, <laughs> right? So now let's look at our future. In a low emission scenario where we really get our act together, we're looking at two degrees Celsius of average global warming. In a high emission scenario, we're looking at closer to five degrees. The last time Earth was two degrees hotter was about 10 million years ago. And the last time Earth was five degrees hotter was about 65 million years ago. So you tell me what kind of animals were really dominating Earth about 65 million years ago. Anyone? Dinosaurs, that's right. So <laughs> massive cold-blooded reptiles. So I'm being a bit facetious here, but the bottom line is that climate has always undergone major changes naturally in the past, but we as humans are, are really not evolved to cope with the temperatures we're heading towards. And we obviously, and hopefully we'll talk about this today, need to do a better job thinking about environmental justice alongside scientific fact. Headlines like this are all around us. It's easy to get lost in the details of just how hot it will get or how much flooding will we have, but what we should really be focused on is who, who is affected the most by these environmental changes and how can we solve them. I saw this headline on CNN the other day and I thought it was particularly profound to see that the intersection of climate change and civil violence not only has been documented now around the global tropics, but is probably now already in the United States. Of course, this is a very anxiety-inducing topic. <laughs> so we have to know how to deal with the emotional exhaustion of talking about climate change. It's a very existential problem. But I will quote the infamous Marie Curie and charge you all with the idea that nothing is to be feared, it is only to be understood. Now is the time for us to understand better this problem so that we can solve it. We don't have any more time to be afraid of climate change. We have to attack this problem with boldness and conviction. And we have the power to control our own environment and our own future. We are a geologic force. So this brings us to the topic of today's section. The problem is solvable. I tell my undergraduate students things are getting better. We've just had two massive pieces of legislation that will allow us to make progress in the transition to clean energy. You can talk to every single person you know. Nobody disagrees that we need clean air and clean water. Most people care about protecting green space. Create consensus, this shouldn't be a partisan issue. All of our conversations about climate change should be about solutions. We don't have any more time, as I said, to talk about just how much hotter it's gonna get. We need to be fixated on the problem and its solutions at this time. For example, you know, one of the things that we know is that we, if we could just harness the power of the sun, which we get for free, we could power our entire civilization for an entire year with one hour of sunlight. There are so many solutions to this problem if we can be innovative. And then, of course, we must be empowered and educated and vote well. So, I hope that you'll join me in introducing these, uh, these fantastic speakers that we have today for our session on climate change, technology, and society. So we're gonna explore the technology innovations that have begun to enable a cleaner and more sustainable economy to impact the societal and cultural changes that will accompany climate change. We'll start off with Dr. Dan Cohan, who will talk about confronting climate gridlock, followed by a brief coffee break. Then we'll hear from Dr. Rick Wilson, who will tell us about the climate commons, individual action and politics. And then finally, from Dr. Dominic Boyer, who will tell us about why technology alone won't solve the climate crisis. Thank you very much, and welcome to this morning's session.